every week every, every week two papers on average so i urge you to enter this world with uh, your eyes open and please acquire the skills with which you can assess what the hell is going on in your subject all right having said that now i present to you something that very likely you have read many times over have been taught many times over by your teachers that randomized trial is number one then is ranked a and then observational studies with comparison or control b and then without comparison c you familiar with this no yes yeah yes sir. Okay. well that's truly is the first step into the jungle now you got to start to distinguish which of the thing that appears to be randomized control trial level a is worth taking forward to help your patients that journey starts after this first step okay as soon as you start this journey i throw to you one new information um, i think it may be new to you i'm not absolutely sure you can tell me if it isn't <clears throat> Diagnostic research does not require this previous hierarchy. Diagnostic research does not use randomized trial or case control study uh, in the same way as effectiveness research does. So the hierarchy randomized trial come first is no longer applicable when we are talking about accuracy of diagnostic test. You're talking about PCR for diagnosing COVID. Well, for this type of a study, there will be no need for a randomized control trial. You need a different set of rules. So here is a recommendation given concerning randomized trial of a, of a test treatment combination versus test accuracy. And here is the grading of evidence recommendation uh, given in a paper published not long ago by my colleague uh, and myself, which highlight that effectiveness and accuracy evidence need to be graded differently. Did, did you guys know this difference between diagnosis and therapy before? No, uh, no doctor. No. Okay, so Please remember, the patient presents to you, the first thing you have to do as a clinician is diagnosis. In the process of doing diagnosis, randomized trial has no role to play. If this is coming to you as a surprise in your fourth or fifth year of medicine, uh, then I am afraid the curriculum is not designed correctly. I am a victim of the same curriculum. I have had to go through a long journey to make these discoveries for myself. I hope you will not have to make that long, difficult journey that I had to go through to make these discoveries. In the assessment of testing or research of testing, we estimate things like sensitivity and specificity. We do not calculate relative risk. In this case, we may assess risk of bias, we may assess indirectness, inconsistency, imprecision, publication bias, and this may lead us to a different conclusion about quality of evidence in the case of sensitivity and a conclusion similar or different about specificity. In randomized control trials, we don't have two measures. We usually have only one measure called relative risk. All right, I take a little break and see if any questions have arisen. Um, I, I can also promise you that I will not give you any new surprises. I will consolidate the knowledge that we have touched upon so far going forward.
Okay, if there are no questions, then let me now. Uh, yes, sorry, please go ahead. Question. Yeah, so, but how about uh, medical devices that are used for diagnosis of, uh, of certain uh, diseases? Wouldn't that, those also go into clinical trials to, you know, test, uh, you know, the, uh, the point of care or the, or the, the other diagnostic testing that it's uh, uh, commonly used. And then we use a, a clinical trial to test if this is more efficient or not. Okay, so clinical trial does not always mean that the study is randomized. That's the first point. Uh, for example, a phase four clinical trial is almost never a randomized study. Neither normally is phase one. Phase two can be a randomized study. Uh, phase three usually is a randomized study. So please don't be fooled by the term clinical trial. It doesn't automatically mean that we are talking about randomization. Secondly, you are quite right. Pro point of care devices used for testing require in many countries, not in all countries, but in many countries, a process of approval. It is not necessary that that approval will require randomized controlled study. Any, any more comment or question concerning this aspect or anything else I've said so far? I had a question, Dr. Hari. Yes, please, go ahead. So I'm working on diagnostic matter, uh, matter right now. So we have some randomized control trials that have actually reported the uh, sensitivity and specificity of two particular diagnostic tests. So you said uh, the randomized control trials actually do not tell us about the accuracy of diagnostic tools. So am I missing well, something? Uh, I, I, well, uh, look, studies can be designed with randomization where accuracy data can be extracted from them. So these will have been studies designed with two different objectives. Is that, I presume that is what you are talking about. Because in the case of screening test, not diagnostic test, in the case of screening test, frequently randomization is used in order to determine if screening effectively prevents, for example, mortality in the case of breast cancer or cervical cancer screening. Yeah, exactly. Like for diagnosis, uh, for screening of a particular lien. Be very careful. You are now not talking about a diagnostic technology. You're talking about a screening technology. OK, but the actual uh, title of that uh, randomized control trial was diagnostic accuracy of imaging. So that's why I was a bit confused. But in the methodology part, they mentioned that this was actually used for the early detection on the DNS. Like they are mentioning that we were doing the okay, screening so part. Welcome to the world of confusion in scientific writing. If they are referring to screening and then talking about diagnosis, basically, Neither the writer nor the study designer nor the editors are making the task of the reader like yourselves and myself easier. It is very well known that authors, not necessarily intentionally, I don't mean that they make intentional uh, mistakes of this kind, uh, perhaps due to lack of training, mislabel the design of the studies they describe and editors and peer reviewers just don't have the capacity or training to be able to correct those errors uh, in the process of peer review. OK, thank you so much. This has been such, such a headwork from me for a long time, like how are these reporting sensitivity and sen uh, specificity in a diagnostic uh, when their research is labeled as diagnostic randomized control trial. Look, sensitivity can be a measure of diagnostic accuracy, can also be a measure of screening accuracy. Both of these things are tests. Yeah. Uh, OK. But I, I urge you to read and analyze for yourself. Don't have blind faith in what you receive from the published journals. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you so much. OK, now. The look there. 
the the purpose of giving you this long background was that in the end a practicing clinician does not have time even if they were given the training they probably have forgotten by the time they come to a decision making role in their career they are looking for organizations their own hospital clinical director or other uh, guideline making bodies, for example, in the United Kingdom, an organization like NICE or insurance companies who pay for uh, the treatments they offer to patients. That they receive from them. A cookbook from which they can make decisions without having to go through the hassle of uh, understanding the complexity involved in uh, dissecting the, the research. OK. For this exists a system called grade. The purpose of the grading system is to say. Whether evidence of high, moderate, low or very low quality. Has been used to generate strong or weak recommendations. You see how simplified this is. We are only talking about four levels of quality of evidence. High, moderate, low and very low and only two. Strengths of recommendations. Strong or weak. So it takes away the whole of the. Difficulty of the kind you just described that you got to read the paper, then the author is confused, the editor is confused, the peer reviewer is confused. The reader obviously doesn't have the skill to know uh, in all cases how to appraise the work they are reading. In any case, even if they had the skill, they don't have the time. Even if they had the time and the skill, they don't have access to all of the papers. Bingo, we give this job to an organization uh, which employs people who do this work day in, day out as a full time job. They collect all the evidence, they summarize it and ultimately with this information, organizations like the World Health Organization will give us a cookbook with recommendations uh, e marked as being strong or weak based on evidence profiling. So. Can you see from this where all of this is coming from and where it is going to? OK, so the first thing is simply knowing that randomized trial is at the highest level is insufficient. It is a starting point. It's the first step in the jungle. The next step is to understand whether the outcomes assessed were critically important, important or not at all important to the patients. Which, as I highlighted, mortality will be far more important than simply the presence or absence of a biomarker or level of a biomarker. Then comes the issue of evidence quality in which not only bias. Uh, but other features related to bias. Uh, will become relevant. In making this assessment, we will look at some study limitations. In the case of meta analysis, uh, we will look at the in the inconsistency of results from study to study uh, with respect to, for example, outcomes. We will look at directness of evidence, then confidence intervals, which is the measure of imprecision and then funnel plot or publication bias. Each one of these deserves. Several hours of discussion, teaching, reading, analysis. Uh, so I won't go into detail just now, but in summary, there are many features that need to be considered in evidence profiling for the purpose of grading. So here we take an example. In preterm birth. Let's say the outcome is of importance and it is in a randomized control trial. But if there are limitations in. 
quality or risk of bias, if there are inconsistencies from study to study, if there is indirectness, if the confidence interval is wide, and if there are other problems like publication bias, suddenly a high quality design, randomized controlled trials of an Im critically important outcome measure can change into low quality evidence for the purpose of grading, given that it has other limitations, even though the, the base is a randomized controlled trial. How does that sound? And Dr. Khalid, what I have understood uh, about this point is that if a research is discussing an important topic that has that we can say that has uh, very limited researches on that topic and it is a randomized trial, but it has those mentioned limitations. So we'll not address them. It is a high quality evidence. We'll just label them as a low quality evidence, although it is highlighting a critical issue on which research is limited. I completely agree with you and the description you provide, I hope is also helpful to other colleagues who are listening to this presentation. Th thank you for that summary. It's completely correct. OK, so when. The WHO and other such organizations make these grading tables, which are of these kinds, they run into pages and pages and pages, sometimes 50, 60, 70, 80 pages. I mean, how the hell can people who are making recommendations read these and understand this they got to act fast and quick for this we propose that in this case a, a diagrammatic system is used which allows for people to see in one glance several outcomes and several interventions all together in one go and then within this we can also introduce a color coding system so that we can see here that under in, of so many interventions available for this particular condition, in fact, only one meets the grading standard of high quality. Most of the others are moderate or low or very low. So you can see that 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 this extensive tabulation can be summarized quite quickly for view at a glance uh, with the possibility of cover code color coding and the covered area of uh, of uh, this diagram okay so we so far talked about reduction in level of evidence but in the case of observational studies in some circumstances the evidence can also be increased to a higher level. For example, I think nobody agrees in today's world that simply because studies of smoking and cancer are generated from case control studies or cohort studies, that they are of low quality evidence. In fact, because they're confounding has been analyzed and distilled, and those response gradients have been de demonstrated, and the magnitude of effect observed is large. This can move up the scale and enter high quality evidence. <clears throat> okay, I now give you a quick summary. Uh, I think I've also already been talking for about 50 minutes. So I'm going to shut up uh, after my quick summary. The purpose of research is to not just publish papers, but to change the lives of our patients. To the journey from research to changing the lives of our patients is not a straightforward journey. It requires us to assess the papers 
and grading system allows for that assessment to be formally summarized and then recommendations generated from those evidence summaries that are called evidence profiles this idea is to make the life of everyday clinical practitioner easier and uh, allow for research to in fact ultimately have an impact on the lives of patients so at this stage i'm going to stop and leave the floor open for questions and comments Okay, Hamza Sahab, if there are no questions, then I would like to thank you, but I'm patient and happy to wait for a little while longer if there are more, uh, if, if people need to take a little bit of time to think about. Okay, so Malia has a question, what do you exactly mean by inconsistency and indirectness? Uh, let me address the question of inconsistency by taking you to another presentation very quickly. Um, I wonder if many of you have seen um, meta-analysis diagrams like this. In this diagram, we have relative risk plotted on what is called a forest plot. We have a diamond, which is uh, the summary of all these studies statistically put together. And in this case, uh, we have a chi-square test carried out, uh, which is not statistically significant, but yet another one, uh, which is concerning the heterogeneity. So inconsistency simply is, how are these results, the individual dots, different from each other? So for example, in this case, the relative risk value is on, the, on a level less than one, and on this one, it's at a value higher than one. These two results are in opposite directions. In this case, we can be confident that these results are inconsistent. Does that make sense? Does that at least answer the question concerning inconsistency, Malia? Yeah, it does. Okay. Indirectness, I remind you to think of the example of mortality versus biomarker. If I'm a patient and I'm being given a treatment, I really want to know whether it reduces the chance of death. I have much less interest or maybe not even any interest at all in whether the level of the biomarker will go down by treatment or not. The biomarker is an indirect measure of the possible outcome cancer. Okay, Malia, uh, thank you for also replying uh, in, uh, in the Q&A. Um, fine, any more question or concern? So if we do a grade assessment of a paper, do we actually report that to a journal or is that done on a more subjective level? Uh, the grade assessment can be reported in a journal as part of the results section or even part of the metrics section of a systematic review article. 
um, I have often done that in my own systematic review article. Uh, so how is that? How is that different from Cochrane, Iska, bias tools, etc.? Like we often use them. Okay, so look, I showed you. Um, this diagram, this table. This part, the limitation of quality, this part is the one part that has arrived here in this table from the risk of bias tool. Do you follow this? You, you can see my arrow, this column, limitations yes. of quality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Only, I'm this part, only this part has arrived here in this table from risk of bias too. This part has come from I square statistic or heterogeneity statistic. This part has come, imprecision has come from measurement or assessment of confidence interval. The indirectness part has come from assessment of the PICO question. The design part has come from assessment of design. And in this table, we haven't written down, but publication bias may also come from assessment of funnel plot. So you can see that risk of bias assessment referred by you to take into account uh, Cochrane risk of bias tool only provides one element of the grading assessment. I hope that makes sense, uh, Mushul. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. So we are Thank doing you. a grade assessment and uh, risk of applying the Cochrane risk of bias tool simultaneously. Well, look, Are, as I explained to you, the risk of bias tool will provide one it, element of the several of, elements required for grade assessment. Our risk of bias tool is considered as a part of grade assessment. Like it's that one is correct. Of the sub OK, thank that you. That is correct. Absolutely thank you, correct. OK, Sakib, uh, you are asking me to explain it again. Uh, Sakib, what are you asking me to explain again? Uh, OK, I wait for Sakib's clarification, but in the meantime, Suha has asked if I think that national and international guidelines written for disease, for example, hypertension, can be can have errors due to poor quality researches. The answer is yes. And the answer is yes with a capital Y is capital E and capital S and all three letters in bold. OK. Uh, somebody is asking to explain the table again. Uh, in indirectness and imprecision. Sakib, I am afraid there is no time to explain this in detail. But the bottom line is these are two elements. Sakib, you asked about indirectness and imprecision. These are only two of various elements. Indirectness is an is a part of the pico question uh, sakib you asked me the question no about indirectness uh, sakib can you unmute your mic okay well maybe you are shy to come uh, on microphone. Look, I ask you to think about it. If you have a relative, mother, father, aunt, uncle, who is uh, unfortunately diagnosed with cancer, my own daughter was diagnosed with cancer, so I have no problem talking about this type of uh, subject. 
<clears throat> then really you, or in my case, me for my daughter, I would really be interested in finding out whether mortality is reduced. I have no interest in finding out whether a biomarker level is reduced by giving chemotherapy. The biomarker is an indirect measure of what I am really interested in. I hope that makes sense. Sakib, uh, or perhaps another colleague in the audience can explain this better than what I have been able to do. And imprecision is simply another word for wide confidence interval. So th that I think is easy to explain. Now there is a separate matter of how is confidence interval calculated, etc., which we can cover on another day. Uh, no, no, that you got it about imprecision and uh, indirectness. Yes, please go ahead. Well, uh, so for the confidence interval, the wider it is, the more imprecise the, uh, our, the paper is or the outcome is. The more imprecise the result is. Yes, that is correct. The wider the confidence so interval, the bad. more imprecise the result. So that's bad. All right, Hamza, shall we bring this to close or do you think there is more interest in more questions? Uh, doctor, I have a question. Please go so ahead. So you say that if there's a wider confidence interval, then it's more imprecise, which makes sense. But are there like criteria or like cutoff values which like determines if it's like the imprecision level is low, moderate or serious? Like are there like cutoff values per se? Same for like indirectness, for example, like if the PCOS is like, like when do you say like the PCOS is causing like a serious level of indirectness as compared to like a moderate level or like it's not significant? <clears throat> okay, so uh, in order to answer the question, I'll ask you a simple question. How do you know that a P value of 0 0.05 is significant or less than 0 0.05 is significant. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, it is a subjective decision. So I, the reason why I raised this point about P0.05 is because it appears to be written in books and explained by colleagues as if this is something God sent, we must believe in it, uh, it is objective, there is no such thing. So p-value of 0 0.05 is subjective, the assessment of indirectness is subjective, the assessment of imprecision is subjective. I'm afraid this is the reality. If anybody is telling you anything different, then really we are creating an illusion to impress others. I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yes, doctor. Thank you. Uh, sir, Dr. Suha has asked another question in the uh, Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. She's asked at our level if we have to judge the quality of a paper before using that information in practice, which one of the factors holds the greatest impact that we should have a lookout for? Well, I take you back to this table. All of these factors are relevant. And the grading system has the beauty that it tries to create objectivity 
in a system that is inherently highly subjective. So I urge you to consider these features as tabulated. Uh, and then if you have several comparators, then consider tabulating, uh, uh, the, the converting the tabulation into graphics of this kind, which add further objectivity and at a glance assessment uh, in a world that is full of subjectivity. So there is no one single feature that trumps another feature. I believe that you've got to consider all of them and weigh them against, weigh them together in as objective a manner as possible, in as transparent a manner as possible, to then say this is what we can or cannot do. <clears throat> I hope that addresses your question. Uh, um. <sighs> okay, so there is a question about how can we increase uh, assessment of directness to patient-centered care. Well, Malia, your question is a million dollar question. This is something that has escaped all of medicine in the last century. Only now we are beginning to consider what is called core outcome set or another thing called patient and public involvement. Nowadays, the idea is that the doctor and scientist is not the custodian of what is important to patient. The patient themselves are custodians of what is important to patient. And the research is required to be directed to addressing what is important to patient. So as we go forward, research would need to be done to determine what is a what is of direct importance to patient and direct our research towards it. This is the simple answer. The journey is a long journey, requires effort. Um, I think within your lifetime, you will see in the coming years that patients will not just be participants in studies. They will also be co-investigators with doctors and other scientists. So lay people or citizens now have been recognized as key players in undertaking research that is of relevance to society. The paternalistic medicine, its time is finished in the last century. We are now in a new millennium. I hope it makes sense what I said. Sure. Uh, I think if we don't have any uh, further questions, uh, then I think uh, we'll uh, end the session. Uh, please go ahead. I think someone had a question. Okay, so I'd like to make some closing remarks. Yes, sir. Sure, please. I would just simply like to say my presentation today was to be provocative and I use this technique as a teaching and learning technique to help you realize that what is written in textbooks is not always the straightforward solution that you will require in coming years as you grow in your career in medicine. And I hope I have encouraged you to think outside the box and more critical than was the case about an hour ago before you uh, started listening to me. Thank you. 
thank you dr Khalid, for the enlightening session uh, i think we'll uh, end the talk here uh, i'd like to thank everyone for participating thank you everyone.